Freedom is the right to share, share fully and equally in American society, to vote, to hold a job, to enter a public place, to go to school. It is the right to be treated in every part of our national life as a person equal in dignity and promise to all others. But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Thus, it is not enough just to open the gates of opportunity. All our citizens must have the ability to walk through those gates. And this is the next and the more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability. Not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. Or the task is to give 20 million Negroes the same chance as every other American to learn and grow, to work and share in society, to develop their abilities, physical, mental, and spiritual, and to pursue their individual happiness. To this end, equal opportunity is essential, but not enough, not enough. Men and women of all races are born with the same range of abilities. But ability is not just the product of birth. Ability is stretched or stunted by the family that you live with and the neighborhoods you live in, by the school you go to, and the poverty or the richness of your surroundings. It is the product of a hundred unseen forces playing upon the little infant, the child, and finally the man. What is going on, everybody? Uh, that clip I just played was Lyndon B. Johnson's speech at the 1965 Howard University. Uh, let me know if you guys can hear me. Press 1. I don't know why this screen is a little blurry. Let me go to over here. There it goes. All right, press one. You can hear me very good. Pretty cool, cool. Okay. Maybe that's on that screen, not this one. All right. But yeah, um, right now we're going to go through the freedom is not enough. Hope everybody... We'll get something out of these next couple of weeks because this is going to be a multi-part series just like I did with the Kerner Commission. Only this time I'm doing it by myself. Um, 
right now we are going to be reading the preface of the Freedom is Not Enough. And what I have for this series is that what I want to do is I'm going to read what's in the book. And then when I get to some key points that I know I need to do videos on, I will do videos on those key points throughout the week. Uh, week. So that way you can get better context to uh, what's going on. So that way you can have a deeper understanding about certain points of what they're talking about. So basically what I'm just going to do is reading it. Then throughout the week, you're going to get um, certain videos on these certain topics that they're talking about. Um, like I already wrote down a couple of um, points that will probably be videos this week from the preface. And then each week I'm um, reading more and more and more of it and putting out more and more videos so that way you have a better, deep understanding about this book. Uh, let's see who's all in here before I start. We got AB Media 83. What's up? He says, congrats on the 1K subs. Appreciate you. Uh, McDrama Bear, what's up? Dar Dar, what's good with you? And... Dardar says one, so I guess everybody's going to hit me very good. All right. Without further ado, let's go ahead and read it. Um, like I said, this is the preface. Um, this is just what the President Johnson was saying in this first part, so I'm not going to read that. So we're just going to start um, right here. Johnson then turned to the serious racial problems at hand. After hailing the impressive achievements of middle-class Black Americans, he dealt at length on social and economic ills, deep corrosive abstain that afflicted what he called the great majority. Blacks were still another nation. This is talking about the two societies. A people damaged by a cultural tradition that had been twisted and battered by endless years of hatred and hopelessness. This is the, um, the separate culture that we had besides the main culture. Perhaps the most important the present emphasizes is the breakdown of the Negro family structure that flowed from centuries of oppression and persecution of the Negro man. The family, Higgs exclaimed is the cornerstone of our society more than any other force it shapes the attitudes the hopes and the ambitions and the values of the child when the family collapses it is the children that are usually damaged when it happens on a massive scale the community itself is crippled what was to be done anxious to take charge of civil rights movement johnson called for what in effect was an affirmative action to be secured via large-scale social economic programs. A chief goal of his administration, he promised, was to fight for policies to improve Black in employment, health care, housing, education, and for social programs better designed to hold families together. He closed by saying that he would convene a White House conference in the fall featuring scholars and experts and outstanding Negro leaders, men of both races and officials of government at every level. The theme entitled the conference will be to fulfill these rights. Some reporters who commented on the president's 30 minute speech wondered if policymakers would devise the programs or secure the funds to wage the massively complex and expensive struggle required to promote equality of results. Johnson's escalation of the war in Vietnam they added, threatened to divide the nation and swallow up funding for domestic programs. Conservatives, however, posed the largest obstacles to enact of Johnson's goals. Enactment of Johnson's goals. Any major governmental effort to combat poverty and the related behavioral ills of Black Americans, they believe, would mire Washington in a costly and futile effort to change the culture of undeserving people. Then and latter, many conservatives would fight hard against ambitions. Yeah, uh, fight hard against and the ambitious liberal economic programs that claim to attack the deeply set family problems 
of lower class black people. So he was having to um, face all this stuff with the Vietnam War. Um, there are people in Washington that felt that they were under these people were undeserving, and so he had as great obstacles to um, counteract this. Johnson's listeners, however, responded jubilantly to his remarks, swarming about him and alarming Secret Service men to shake his hand after he finished. Liberals delighted that he planned to address radical or racial ten tensions in the North as well as in the South, held his egalitarian message. Civil rights leaders, including um, A. Philip Randolph, head of the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car um, Porters, and Whitey, well, not Whitey, Whitney Young, head of the National Urban League, telegraphed their congratulations. Martin Luther King Jr. declared, number four has a president, articulated the depths and dimensions of the problems more elo eloquently and profoundly. Johnson himself later said, and rightfully so, that this was the greatest civil rights speech he had ever given. Mm -hmm. There was ample reason for high hopes because liberalism was uh, cresting at the extraordinary high tide in the early 1965. And remember, this is around the same time as the um, immigration bill. So you're going to have a lot of immigrants pouring into these urban centers at this time, too, because... Um, Johnson also did the immigration bill in 1965, I believe. After winning the presidential election of 1964, with what remains the highest percentage of popular vote, 61.1% in modern U.S. history, Johnson understandably believed that people had given him the mandate for change. Hell, he exclaimed, we're the richest country in the world, the most powerful. We can do it all. Lightning the White House Christmas tree on December, he announced that these are the most hopeful times since Christ was born. LBJ's optimism was infectious at the time. Time Magazine, naming him the Man of the Year for 1964, predicted in January 1965 that the United States, which was enjoying great prosperity, was on the fringe of a golden era. Polls showed that Americans were developing grand expectations about the capacity of the government to promote progress. The civil rights movement, through exhibiting signs of division, climbed to the peak of its inspirational power during the demonstrations for voting rights in Selma, Alabama, when white authorities re reacted <clears throat> excuse me, with violence in Selma. LGBT gave a primetime televised speech to Congress in March that he closed by emphasizing, and we shall overcome. Taking full advantage of these prosperous times, LBJ was relentless as well as brilliant in driving Democratic majorities on Capitol Hill toward an enactment of his highly ambitious Great Society agenda. By June 1965, Congress had passed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which for the, for, uh, excuse me, which for the first time in U.S. history provided the substantial federal funding for public schooling. Its key provisions calling for compensatory education and the core of its um, border war on poverty, a broader war on poverty, which had been set in motion in 1964. Congress was also well on its way that June toward enacting other liberal landmarks, such as its voting rights bill and Medicare and Medicaid. By October, Congress had approved an enormous bundle of liberal legis legislation. Can't talk today including a long overdue reform of the discriminatory immigration law, state house the 1965 immigration bill. Additional funding for the war on poverty, a higher education act, clean air, water acts, established the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the creation of national endowment for the arts and a national endowment for the humanities. No Congress in US history had been more productive. So a lot of um, the stuff that we are enjoying today got passed during the 60s, especially in the mid 60s. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, he passed a lot of legislation at the time. So that way um, they got more stuff done back then because they wanted to um, set forth a standard. <clears throat> um, neither then nor the later years, however, did the United States come close to securing the egalitarian racial goals of Johnson outlined in his speech at Howard. A consensual uh, source of this failure 
which had been become profound, pain, uh, excuse me, painfully obvious by late 1965, was clear. The tumultuous trail of misunderstandings and misrepresentation and the destructive uh, controversy that followed the release of the summer of the so-called Monaghan Report, <clears throat> titled The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. The 78-page report, which painted the, uh, this uh, dismal portrait of lower-class Black family life in the inner cities, rested on part of a research and statistics compiled by the policy planning and research staff of the USS Department of Labor, <clears throat> or the U.S., USS. <laughs> it's Arthur Daniel Patrick Pat Moynihan, a 38-year-old politician academic who initiated the research and who completed the report in March 1965, three months before Johnson's address at Howard while serving as an assistant secretary of labor. So this report came out three months before Johnson's address at Howard. Moynihan was a liberal and he aimed his report on top of administration officials in the hopes that they would thereby, there, yeah, <clears throat> thereby understand the most powerful forces, especially unemployment and poverty, devastating many lower-class Black families, unlike the Howard Address, which was co uh, coached in moral language and the report was cool in tone. It was diagnostic, not um, perceptive, and it offered no specific policy recommendations. <clears throat> so what was that mean? It just outlined the statistics. Monaghan just told it with statistics what they were, how the graphs were, this, that. It didn't give any um, recommendations. It didn't do anything like that. It just, these are the stats, and this is what the findings are. It didn't tell people what their conclusions were. It just said that this is what it was. They didn't tell people what the policies need to be changed or anything like that. It was just a report giving you the stats of the black family, of the of the lives that they're living, what order, um, where they are stand at this point in time, and that's what the Monahan report was. It was not something that gave you answers. It was just a statistical document. That's all it was. Still, in, and it was supposed to get cause for a bigger discussion to have. Like, what are the, what do these stats mean? The, and because of the Monahan Report, this is why we got the Kerner Commission. All right, let's continue. Still, the Negro family obviously aimed to start a serious conversation among policymakers and to um, productive government officials in divesting for researching sucking and aquatic forms. Monahan, moreover, was um, gracious, ambitious, and persistent following who had crafted good connections with influential president aides. He also had talent for dramatic phrase making that caught the eyes of readers. Secretary of Labor uh, Willard Wartz, I mean, Lee, that's his last name, forwarding the summary of the report to the president in May, described the accompanying Monaghan memo as nine pages of dy um, dynamite about the Negro situation. Excited White House officials said to Monahan, Pat, I think you got it. Johnson appraised, apprised of the um, report, then asked Monahan to help draft his speech in Howard University after completing a draft on June 1st. Monahan and presidential speechwriter Richard Goodwin worked in the early morning and the hours of June 4th to put together the finished version. This is how the woes of the lower class inner black uh, city black families then and later are key concerns on Monahan found a prominent place in Johnson's widely held address to the, the next and more profound stage of the battle of civil rights in the United States. In his speech, Johnson did not mention Monaghan. Indeed, only a few government officials had then seen the report, which had been written and printed as an in-house document, not as a manifesto for the public consumption. Nowhere did it identify the name of its author. The report soon leaked, however, and news stories about it and this author began appearing in mid-July. Well, like we said in this space before, this report, the Monaghan report, was not supposed to get out. It was just supposed to be for the uh, the higher officials just to look at. But it got leaked. 
And so that's when they started talking about it because they had no choice. It was a leaked document. The report soon leaked, however, and news stories about it and its author began appearing in mid-July, whereupon it became known as the Monaghan Report. The White House then arranged for copies to be printed so that they might be ready for sale in mid-August. Before the report was released publicly, however, the, mo the most fearsome urban violence in U.S. history broke out in a predominantly Black area of Watts in Los Angeles, starting on August 11th, and it lasted five days before the National Guard restored order. This is the Watts riots. 34 people were killed, more than 1,000 people were injured, and it was a disaster for the morally powerful um, interracial nonviolent civil rights movement King and many others had succeeded into sh in shaping into a luminous force for racial justice. Many white Americans appalled by the rioting began to reconsider their views on black people, not as a cruelly segregated long suffering Southerners, but as a violent, out of control ghetto dwellers, many of whom who lived in the North. Josh, um, <clears throat> Johnson displayed this brave, I'm giving them both them boom times and more good legislation than anyone else ever did. What do they what do they yeah, what do they do? Attack the sneer? Could FDR do better? Could anybody do better? What do they want? The Watts riots, which surprised many civil rights leaders, as well as Johnson, led reporters and others to scramble in search of a key sources of black urban unrest. In the process, they rushed to get their hands on copies of the Monaghan Report, which news accounts, hyping its influence within the government, often referred to as secret. As of early September, by which time the report had been released upon request, stories about it began to proliferate and demand for it exploded. Some of the stories correctly connected the report to Johnson's subsequent speech at Howard, but others, including many uh, that depended uh, upon media uh, accounts, not on the report itself, concluded inaccurately that it represented the administration's explanation for the breakdown of the order in the Los Angeles, which it didn't. Further misunderstandings and misrepresentations ensued. Although some of these early stories reported correctly that the Monaghan Report pointed to the rise of the Black middle class, Others initiated that it was the author that had lumped all black families together, thereby leaving the impression that all were badly damaged. A number of stories also recognized that Monaghan, a committed liberal, had identified white racism and highly unemployment rates as the primary source of insustainability for lower class black families that cause the causes of their plight and emphasized were primarily economic and not cultural in nature, but many other news stories and commentators so zeroed in on the bold-faced headlines and passages of the report that painted a devastating portrait of family disorganization. So they only focused on the bad parts, but they didn't focus on anything that was good that the report was saying, pretty much like people in the manosphere does. <laughs> Because the if because we go back into the report, it does highlight that there have been Ill, Ill, high illegitimacy rates of children being born in the report of two lower class families. Um, <clears throat> those were the stats, but it does say the black middle class did was rising. It does say that, but the main problem is lower class black families. That's what the report was pointing out and the disorganization that those families had because of poor unemployment, um, the matriarchal structure being opposite of the patriarchal structure that the country had, women leading households and st stuff like that, men not being able to find work when they came into these urban centers. Um, Let's see, where was that? Zero on both face headlines and passages of his report to paint a devastating portrait of family disorganization. Monaghan dwelt on statistics. The report featured a great many graphs and tables showing startling increases in welfare dependency, matriarchy, and illegitimacy ratios among blacks. These ratios, he wrote, were eight times higher than among whites. Found a dramatic language, he wrote, that lower class black families were caught in a tangle of pathology. 
that had its roots in North American slavery and that it perhaps begun to feed on itself. Passages such as these framing highly insensitive issues in near apocalyptic terms seem to suggest that deep-seated historical forces had all but irreparably uh, savage Black culture. As it happened, Monaghan had resigned from the government service in July to run as a Democratic, uh, Democratic primary for his presidency of the Civil Council of New York. But as September, his identity as author of the report having been exposed, he was facing increasingly irate criticisms from militant civil rights leaders, many of whom had been shaken by Watts and were beginning to adopt what later became known as Black Power Strategies of Protest. <coughs> A number of women, too, resented his not altogether flanning descriptions of the black matriarchy. So the women were mad because he was exposing them, exposing the world what they were doing. They were being matriarchs, and they didn't want the world to get out like that. So they criticized him, saying, well, we don't lead the black family. We don't lead black people. So that's kind of like what today's going on through. Because ever since we started talking about the, uh, the matriarchy of the black community, you got all these people saying the black community is not a matriarchy and all sort of stuff too. So it, the same stuff that happened back then is happening now. Stunned by Monaghan's grim portrait of angry African-American folks, people charged that he had smeared black culture and blamed the victim. We've heard that before in the Carter Commission about the blaming the victim. As Christopher Foreman, a professor of social policy, later nominated, these leaders were in no mood to hear some Irishman's embarrassing prattle about Negro family structure, however, plainly sympathetic and data laden. So basically, they didn't care about the facts, if it was true or not. They just didn't want to hear, hear no white man talk about it. How can you tell? How can you tell us about our family structure, even though you got stats and statistics? Where have you heard that before? In December, James Farmer, head of the Congress of Racial Equality um, Corps, denounced the report as a massive cop out for white conscience. He added, "We are sick until death of being analyzed and." mesmerized, brought, um, bought, sold, and slobbered over while the same evils that are the ingredients of our oppression go unattained. So it was during the summer of the fall of 1965, a pivotal, uh, pivotal time in modern um, U.S. Um, political history, the exuberant liberal mood of the spring dissipated. The civil rights movement, which had been so inspiring during the struggles in Selma, was breaking apart. Johnson, shaken by the rioting, was disengaging from his egalitarian call at Howard. And even events abroad were absorbing the president's attention. On June 7, only three days after his speech at Howard, he had received a cable from General William Westmoreland, his commander in Vietnam, calling for a massive military escalation. Johnson publicly announced a policy of escalation in late July, Thereafter, there was no turning back. As casualties began to soar, anti-war protests mounted. Polls revealed that Americans were losing faith in their government. Liberalism, so strong in the spring, fell on defense, fell on the defensive. Never again in the 20th century to regain the political power that it had enjoyed in the early 1965. As Monaghan later pointed out, LBJ's address at how it was his last peacetime speech. For these reasons, to distance himself from the hail of criticism battering the Negro family, LBJ downsized his promise to the White House conference to a planning session that finally took place in November. Deliberately un underplaying the importance of the sensitivity, uh, underplaying the importance of sensitive family issues, the session uh, accomplished nothing. In Monaghan, the message of inconvenient tidings remained a very large target of criticism. Then and forever after, in the otherwise successful and visible career as the author professor of Harvard, high-level official in the Nixon and Ford administration starting in 1977, four-term Democratic senator from New York, the most celebrated intellectual in U.S. policies, had dodged negative fallout from his report. 
Later chapters of his book follow Monaghan's ideological odyssey as he continued to promote public interest in helping solve lower class black family problems. His thinking cumulative in the social welfare legislation as well as in 18, as in 18 books, as many of which he offers shrewd and productive commentary about the relationship between scholarship and public policy and about the forces that have helped to re revolutionize family life in the United States. Many other individualized nations since 1965, until relatively recently, however, many liberals and civil rights leaders, fearing to be attacked as he had been, continue to avoid talking about many Black family issues. So they put it back at the back front. They didn't want to talk about family issues. They didn't want to bring it up because they didn't want to be criticized and attacked. So because of the criticism and the attacks, like said Kevin Samuels, they said, we don't want to be attacked. We don't want our career to be hurt by this. So guess what? We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to do anything about it. Because if we talk about it, do something about it, guess what? Careers will be in trouble, just like Monaghan. Monaghan um, didn't um, want to stay clear from this for, for a very long time. He still talked about it. And he suffered because of it. His career suffered. <clears throat> uh, continuing to talk about black family issues. As foremen observed in 1999, social policy thinkers and researchers have been making up for considerable lost time as a result. But this was not a biography. These pages focus on the efforts by Monaghan and others to cope with the revolutionary developments that have worsened the plight of the inner city black families over years. And on the counter moves by the variety groups, mostly conservative in temperament, that have uh, stymed liberal initiatives to better the situation. Indeed, many of Monaghan's alarms in 1965 were profit out of wedlock black births in the United States shown that Monaghan to be 23.6% of all babies born to black families in 1963 jumped to 72% by 2007. Millions of these babies growing up in female headed families has suffered from poverty and a host of social and behavioral ills. Ratios of non-marital births among whites and Latinos, too, have escalated over the years. In 2007, a record high 39.7% of all babies in the United States were born out of wedlock. On Father's Day of 2008, Barack Obama, whose father had left his mother, publicly laminated the meteoric rise in the numbers of black uh, fatherless black families, he exclaimed, I know all the toll it took on me not having a father in the house. So I resolved many years ago that it was my obligation to break the cycle, that if I could be anything in life, I would be a good father to my children. Too many black fathers, he declared, have abandoned their responsibilities, acting like boys instead of men. Heartened by Obama's remarks, some reformers now dare to believe that something like the national action which Monaghan dreamed might someday come to pass. Effective approaches to dealing with lower class black families, uh, Missouri's uh, re, uh, remain is elusive. However, the part of the enduring sensitivity of the issues, even now it remains easy to be char uh, charged as Monaghan was with blaming the victim. Indeed, Reverend, Je Reverend Je uh, Jesse Jackson accused Obama of talking down to black people. See this again? If you talk about black people and their family structure, you get attacked by, by black people. Even Jesse Jackson said he talked down to black people. Remember that um, clip that said, who does this nigga think he is? This is the gynocracy talking. You don't talk bad about Big Mama. You don't. And when you talk bad about Big Mama, you get attacked. How many times have people have you told people in this in this space about what we talk about? You get attacked. Hell, if you talk about this and with your even your own family, you get attacked. You get you get talked about being talked down upon. So. This is just something that happens. Um, let's just see where we're at. 
Liberal reformers, moreover, continued to struggle for answers that will receive political support. So it was the trail of misunderstandings, remains, and treacherous. The stubbornness of historical rooted racial um, antagonism. I do not have to say that word. Antagonisms. That is a new word for me to learn. They're uh, apparently exonerable and cultural and economic trends that have altered sexual behavior and family structure and the burdens that have continued to afflict the poor. All have conspired to dim the dreams of Monaghan, LBJ, and other advocates of racial equality as a fact the results in the United States freedom and Johnson had recognized that Howard has been in, has been and has not been enough. So, in short, this is the, pretty much the summary of the book. Um, they were talking about the family structure back in the 60s, but because the report garnered so much hate and criticisms, and when people saw that Monaghan's career had folded, other people stopped talking about it. People didn't want to talk about black family life, black family structure, black, black family um, 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 poor about the poor, about the importance of black families. They didn't do anything, which is why you started seeing the pathology of when they did the uh, welfare act just to pacify. And you started seeing all these welfare queens, mothers, when you want to call it, come about. When you, I think Gigi showed a video of the women where they were head of the household because, and these poor women, because they didn't need no um, men in the house. And they were getting money and they used their kids to help them live a better life because those kids would actually have kids. So you had 15 year olds having children, living with the mother, getting more money from welfare. kicking the man out. They said, this is where you got the whole, I don't need a man in the black community. It wasn't until Bill Clinton where this changed. Remember when I showed you guys um, the, uh, the change in the child support, um, not child support, but the welfare law back in 1961 or 62, I believe. What did it show? There was a great dependency on welfare because the women chose welfare over having husbands. The Monaghan Report showed this graph. That's what's called Monaghan Scissors. That was the dependency on welfare because they wanted to not have a husband. That's why you had this whole, did the Monaghan, uh, did they really kick the husband out? Yeah, they chose welfare. They chose welfare over husbands. They would rather have welfare than to live with a man. And even when they changed the law back in 19... I think it was 68, where you had the man in the house. Guess what it said in that document? It states that you can have a man there, but he can't work. He can't be the father of that child. He could be your boyfriend, but he can't work. And whatever money he's contributing to that household is going to affect your welfare. So naturally, what what, what, what do women do? They got a man that, that won't work shit. They got a man that was not going to, didn't want to work. He was in-house dick. And that's what these laws promoted, in-house dick. And guess what your children are seeing? This was talking about the sexual behavior. And this is just a pathology that continued and exasperated because of the welfare system. And it did nothing to help us as a people. Did nothing. It actually, it really did hurt us. It caused 
what we have now is like what eighty percent of our children right now have been born out of wedlock. So that is just the um, first part. I want to talk about it. I'm not going to be very long um, on these because I'm going to do them chapter by chapter. Um, next chapter is chapter one, the pluck of the Irish. We're going to go through that next Tuesday. Um, since this is was well, a short summary, and I will be doing videos on this because I'm going to be making videos on this tonight. Um, I do have like a little bit of time before I have to get something to eat because I haven't had dinner yet. So if you guys want me to drop the link so you can talk about this preface to fulfill the rights, and we can have like a little um, panel for like maybe like 30 minutes to an hour. That's about it. Please press one and I'll drop the link. If not, then I'll we'll go ahead and end it right here and then we'll um, pick up on next Tuesday on the live. But if you're willing to come up, press one so we can talk about it. If not, then I'll go ahead and end the stream. I know I, I don't usually do stuff on Tuesday, so I know a lot of people are not going to come. I'm not going to show up quite yet. Maybe a lot more people show up next Tuesday because they know I'm doing stuff on Tuesdays now. Oh, damn. Damn, mouse disconnected. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Kelvin Bien. Uh AL says one. All right. Daughter says he'll get the cash up in a minute. Oh, I didn't even put the banner up. There you go. All right. <clears throat> I guess AL will come up, so we're going to drop in. If anybody else wants to come up and talk about this, I, I think B just put it out there. Amari Brown will look at this, too. So Amari Brown's going to have some content. But yeah, but like I said, um, this week I'll be doing. Um, I got I got about. Where's my notes? I'll probably be doing at least three videos this week on just this section alone. Um, the first video I'm going to be doing is going to be on the Great Society agenda. Then we're going to talk about the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car um, Porters. In the National Urban League, and what um, to fulfill these rights are are about. What's that, Al? Hey, what's going on? Good to hear from you, buddy. Uh, I just uh, jumped on, and I read the title. And I was like, "Oh, this is it. he's on the instant stuff." You were talking about Monahan when I read it from uh, LBJ to uh, Obama. I was like, oh man, I mean, I, me and a few others from late 40s on up, we pretty much have lived to live. So, live so, you know, this is something well worth uh, studying, understanding, and having something to talk about. But when I seen I was the only one, I was just back to check you, man, gone and get you something to eat. I just wait for your next one. I thought, you know, the more people would come up and, you know, we have a little bit more good of a dialogue. But uh, what I'm going to do is, because, like I said, I just came out. I was just about to back it up and listen to you again and hear everything again. You know, coming back to getting something easy. You know, break it down and fix it. I was like, okay, that'll work. I mean, yeah, 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 I was just yeah, reading, we, we, yeah, I'm just reading. Uh, out out and, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, well, you know, this is about 20 or something. Most of us are regular. So, uh, I'm going to just get out your way and I'm going to go back and uh, back this up so I can listen to what you had to say. So I'll be more informed and be ready. But, yeah. All 
Okay. All right. No problem. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, he dropped off. But yeah, I can hear you, AL. Um, well, um, <clears throat> like I said, first one out of, out of many others, because I'm I'm pretty sure this is going to be a pretty long series. Like I said, I'm going through the books this year. I'm going to read these uh, chapters, and then I'm going to break down the chapters and make videos on certain points throughout the week. That is the goal of me doing this. I'm reading these books and giving you guys the information that you guys need. Um, and I'll be doing these every Tuesday. So every Tuesday, um, if Gigi is starting doing history, I might start doing them at 8 o'clock and just probably doing for like a good hour. Like an hour read, and then throughout the week, I'll break them down even further. So that way I'm not um, intruding on art and the stalls, artists on the spot. So I, I'm, I don't like trying to interject um, people's streams. So what's up, PK? But with that, um, like I said, be on the lookout this week for um, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Carp uh, Porters, a video on the Great Society agenda, and to fulfill the rights. And I think I might have one more. I might do it. I might do one on the watch riots and talk about that. But. Other than that, appreciate you guys for coming through on this part one. Um, part two will be next uh, next Tuesday around eight. Yeah, about around eight. Because I think Gigi left around seven thirty, so I'll do mine around eight, and then at nine, then y'all can go just head over to Art and the Stalls. I think he Art and the Stalls starts his at like nine. So, without further ado, let you guys get out of here. Enjoy the rest of your day, and. Share the knowledge, and I will catch you guys later. Deuces.